All right, we're going to sing Like a River Glorious, hymn number 494. Frances Havergal was a poet and hymn writer. She also wrote hymn melodies, religious tracts, and works for children. She knew several modern languages. Um, right after lunch is a hard time to listen to a message, I know. It's also a hard time to give a message. Um, but we'll do our best to do that. This particular session is an exposition of the letter to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. So if you'll go there, I'm not sure you can read that too well. My color things didn't come out quite well. The syncretistic idolatry of the church today. When you look at that picture, I think you understand it, don't you? Uh, It was actually uh, done by a Roman Catholic uh, priest, I believe. Uh, who was trying to illustrate, and he took off the, in the picture the, the statue of the idol, and he put an iPhone up there instead. <laughs> and there is a message there that's pretty accurate, uh, even though the source may be Roman Catholic. Uh, it was, uh, it's, you know, it's a cultural statement about some of the problems that we face today. So in uh, Revelation chapter 2, The letter to the church of Thyatira, verse 18. I'll begin reading. And I'd like to read the entire letter. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, say this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds." And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds unto the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We have in this letter, which is the fourth letter, I think the centerpiece of the seven letters. Now, I've, you know, I've looked back in my files, and it's amazing how much I have spoken about the church at Ephesus and losing their first love, and how much I've spoken about Laodicea, I will spew you out of my mouth. And uh, I have not done as much preaching on Thyatira. But it's interesting that Thyatira is in the middle And there's some linguistic shifts that happen. For example, uh, the order at the end, the idea of the the rewards that are given, the statement of the overcomers, that statement is shifted here to being first before the statement, whoever here has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's a shift, and that shift probably signals something in the text, maybe highlighting this particular church and and I tend to think there may be a chiastic order to the seven letters, and if that's true, right smack dab in the middle is the letter to Thyatira. And it has a message that I think resonates with the problem that we have today. Why? Because it deals with what I believe is the greatest problem that the people of God have in any dispensation. And so we'll see what that is as we go through this particular letter It begins with a portrait of Jesus, as all the letters do. Most of the portraits come from chapter 1. This particular statement does not. 
Jesus is called the Son of God. If you look there in uh, verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, the Son of God. So Jesus, who is giving the letter, described as the Son of God. This is the only occurrence in the apocalypse of that term. We have Son of Man in chapter 1. We have some other designations. Now, there are passages throughout Revelation that speak of the Father-Son relationship with Jesus and the, and the Father, but it doesn't use the term Son of God. This is the only occurrence. And there may be Jewish background to that. You know, the term Son of God is used in a number of ways in Scripture, is it not? Sometimes angels are called sons of God. We know that. We know that Jesus is called a son of God, and I would suggest in multiple ways. I am called a son of God, but I am not a son of God in the same way that Jesus is. Would you agree with that? Okay. And you are a son of God, and you're not the son of God in the same way that uh, Jesus is. But we know that Solomon was called a son of God. Second Samuel 7, in the giving of the Davidic covenant, God says, I will be a father to him. He, talking about Solomon, will be a son to me. David is called a son of God in Psalm 89. In Psalm 2, the coronation psalm, the royal psalm, which I think was probably sung every time a Davidic king was anointed and coronated <clears throat> in the ceremony of his kingship. And I think we may sing that and we'll learn the tune when Jesus is coronated. At least I like to think so, but we'll find out. Uh, but in there, all the Davidic kings seem to be called a son of God. Hebrews 1, again, calls Jesus a son of God, not because of his relationship in the Trinity, but because of his kingship over Israel, if you track that carefully. So there could be this Jewish background. Jesus is the king. In chapter 1, the Son of Man passage from Daniel 7 was mentioned. And in chapter 1, uh, that Daniel 7 reference, a reference to the second coming, I believe, when the kingdom will start, not at the ascension, but when Jesus returns, the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days, when the little horn is destroyed, in Daniel 7, to set up his kingdom on the earth. So Son of God equals Messianic King. Sometimes it's used that way. And in the mind of at least the Jewish people, who they may have uh, stirred that up, and plus even the others, because the Old Testament text is what they've been studying. So that could be there in the background. Of course, there is the Christian background. Who is this that Jesus is giving the vision to? It's the Apostle John. And, of course, he has given to us the classic statement about the deity of Christ. Isn't that all right? John 1.1. 1, 1. And so you have the deity of the Lord, and in the book of Revelation, it, it's one of the best books to go to prove the deity of Christ. Don't mind what the Jehovah Witnesses say. Go to the book of Revelation, and the Lamb of God who is God sits in the throne of God. Just track that throughout the book. Early in chapter 1, go to chapter 22. The book ends of, of the, the book, uh, plus the, the Lamb in the middle on the throne. Just check it out, and you'll see the deity of Christ. And so you have that Trinitarian relationship that Jesus has with the Father that we notice in John chapter 17, that high priestly prayer when Jesus speaks. He, he pushes back the Father-Son relationship into eternity past. And so we know he's the Son of God by his relationship to the Father in the Godhead. But then there is something else going on here, and it could be since Jesus embodies both of those. Correct? He is God, but he's also the coming Messianic king. He embodies both of those. But there's another background thing, which he does not embody this one, but it forms some of the background to why he would choose this for Thyatira. And that's the pagan context of the church at Thyatira. The church at Thyatira is probably the least well-known of all the churches among Christians. It's also the littlest piddly squat place of all the seven churches. Had a little military fortification there. Wasn't much, but it was in a valley where the people from the east would come, the people from the west would come, and, they'd, you know, and the city would be different sides depending on who won. 
from the battles on the way from Pergamum off to the east. And so uh, it was kind of an out-of-the-way place and not, uh, not all that strategic. It was kind of a slow-down maneuver. So we figure we'll be overrun, but it will hold them off for a while till, till the good guys get here. A little bit like the Alamo. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the things, uh, you know, they had their Anatolian gods, the Asia Minor gods that they had. And, and in the Greek period, uh, those developed. But then when the Romans came in, they kind of, they were very syncretistic themselves, and the pagans would just take their god, whoever that was, or goddess, and they would just take the Roman god and kind of slap them together and make them the same thing. That's common among pagan in paganism, just common. And of course, the Roman god that was picked was Apollos, or Apollo, excuse me. Apollo, if you know your mythology, is the son of who? Zeus. His sister is Artemis, or Diana. She's hanging out over in Ephesus. But Thyatira adopted Apollo. He's their main guy. And so they're walking around talking about the son of God. And so we have in the letter, Jesus reminds the church, who the real son of God is. You're walking around town and they're talking about Apollo. I am the son of God. The son of God who speaks to you. But notice also in this portrait, the judgment imagery. This does come out of chapter one. He he has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. Now, is that pleasant imagery? No. That's not pleasant imagery. When my mama had eyes like a flame of fire, I did not uh, want to be around her. This is imagery that is judgment imagery. He's about to give a message, a warning message, and judgment. He's emphasizing that here in this passage. Of course, the whole book of Revelation is filled with that. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, in our sixth presentation, but his feet are like burnished bronze. Now, it's interesting. In Thyatira, that has a connection also. Thyatira was famous for its guilds. Had a guild for this and a guild for that. You know, all the people who are skilled in um, dyeing wool, all the people who are skilled in silver mining, all the people who are skilled in making coins, uh, all the people who are skilled at making garments, they probably, one scholar suggested they had maybe 30 different guilds in Thyatira. And it's a small, out-of-the-way place. And their guilds were really all that they had. Now, they had many gods and goddesses, but their main one was Apollo. And how the guilds would function would be they would meet together in regularity, but all of their meetings to do their commerce and their trading and their discussions about their guild stuff was centered around their false worship of their patron gods or goddesses, as it may be, and a lot of those were Apollo. Now, this, is, this would be interesting because to the ears, that one of the guilds was the people who worked with bronze, this burnished bronze stuff, the metal workers. And so as they were listening to that, I think their antenna would go up. The son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. Judgment imagery speaking to in language that they wouldn't understand. But then we go to the commendation in chapter uh, chapter 2. Verse 19, he says, I know your deeds. Some translations, I know your works. Basically, I know what you're doing. I know all about that. And uh, when you think about lists like this, it's possible 
that the first thing in the list is kind of a summary of all the others in the list. Sometimes that happens, and there's debate here about this, but what does he go on to say? He, he has love listed. He has faith listed, and a debate there about whether it's their faith or trust, or is it their faithfulness, those kind of things. Then there's their service and their perseverance, that they hang in there. But the thing that catches my attention in verse 19 is the next part. He says, your deeds of late are greater than at first. Do you notice what that's the opposite of? That's the opposite of Ephesus. At Ephesus, they had lost their first love. They used to be better. And now they've gone downhill. Here he's saying to the church, you're actually doing better now or later than you were earlier. Now, that'd be nice to be able to say that of our churches and of your church, that you're doing better now than you used to do. That's really our goal every year. Our theology ought to be better as we grow in the Lord and the knowledge of, of his word. Our uh, service, our ministry, our evangelism, our teaching, everything should be on the up and up. And Jesus says this about Thyatira. That is a pretty good thing to say about a church. And, the, you know, and I've, uh, I've pastored a few churches and I even started one. Uh, and uh, there were times when I'm, I look at my church and I'm not sure Jesus could say that about my church. You know, we have five steps forward, 17 steps backwards. Four steps forward, three steps back. You know, you know, in church planting, that's the way life sometimes is. You know, you struggle to get launched. It was fun. It's a whole lot more fun to give birth than raise the dead. Uh, and, uh, but it was a, it was a challenge uh, all across the board. But Thyatira, I mean, they could look at that, and they're listening to that, and they could, wow, Jesus said that about us. But before they get uh, too secure, Jesus jumps in right away. He gives the statement of the problem. He gives a call to repent and temporal judgment on the church. So something is, something is amiss. It's not all right in Thyatira. And the statement of the problem, let's, let's kind of walk through these. The statement of the problem, first, the church tolerates Jezebel, whoever that is. Verse 20, but I have this against you, and he's talking to the church, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Jezebel I take as a real woman. There's a lot of debate here about that. Some commentators take it as uh, a symbol of something else and not a real person. I don't know of any reason not to take it as a real person because it goes on to talk about her in, in ways that apply to an individual and it talks about her children and other things. Uh, so we need to look at Jezebel as a real woman. But I do believe the name is probably a nickname from the Old Testament story of Ahab and Jezebel. Have you ever called some woman a Jezebel? Not and live through it, he says. Okay. Okay. Um, we, you, we sometimes throw names at people, don't we? Uh, we do that. You know, one of the favorite names to be thrown at people is Hitler. You know, every Republican president is called Hitler. You know, so, you know, we have that name throwing uh, all the time. But here, uh, she's, it's a nickname. Whether she adopted that herself, or whether that's just the name that she's been given by Jesus in this, you know, he calls her, Je the name's given, she's Jezebel. And it's probably a reference to the Old Testament story of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, I, I believe you have read that story, have you not? And it does not end well for Jezebel. What happens to Jezebel in the end? Okay, thrown out a window, eaten by dogs, we'll stop there. So it, it didn't happen well. And Ahab didn't happen, it ended for him earlier. 
He dies like after three years after the prophet gives the message, and she's like 20 years later. Well, she's pagan. He's a believer. God expects more from believers, and he's the king. And God took him quicker. I don't know if there's something to that, but that, something to think about. Um, she labels herself a prophetess in the story. Who calls herself a prophetess? It's not, Jesus is not giving her that designation. He refuses to do that. It's, she's the one who calls herself a prophetess. So she views herself as someone who is receiving messages from God to pass on to the congregation, or at least to her faction in the congregation. And she teaches false doctrine and practice. Is described, she teaches and leads my bond servants astray. So she is impacting the church in a negative way. She's leading saints, probably real saints, believers, not false believers, maybe so. Is she a believer? That's a question to ask. But she is leading them astray. And as we know, Christians can get crossways with God. And she is leading them all astray. And there are two things that it talks about. Two things the Jezebel faction taught and practiced using the trade guilds. I'm going to explain using the trade guilds here in just a minute. I put up a picture of the snake and an apple. I have no idea that in the garden it was an apple. Could have been an onion for all I know. But I just used the snake to represent sexual immorality. Notice in the text it says, she leads her bond servants astray so that they commit... It's the act of doing, commit acts of immorality. And then eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, I put a picture there of a statue of Apollo. Because in, one of the, in the, some of the guild meetings, it would be Apollo that they would be worshiping as part of the guild meetings. And that's where they would eat the things sacrificed to idols. Now, these two things I take in a rather literal way. Uh, some commentators take the idea of committing acts of immorality as spiritual adultery. And certainly, in the stories we're going to look at here in just a minute from the book of Numbers, there is spiritual idolatry going on that is cheating on God. That's happening. But I think in the context of Thyatira and the guilds that what we have here is genuine sexual immorality because the pagan meetings were filled, the guilds come together, they were filled with eating things sacrificed to idols, great parties, and sexual participation. And so when the true Christians would come into those guild meetings, they were confronted with choices. They were saying, okay, I'm just here to do business. It's my guild. You know, I'm a, I'm a copper miner or something. You know, I'm, I'm coming in to do my business with other guys, to make myself known so I can do business, sell things, all that, whatever the guild was. But to sit there and have a meal, you're eating food sacrificed to idols. You know, and that has positive and negative things about it. But also, there's the sexual immorality that's going on. So, do you get up and leave or not go to start with? Or do you just be there and not participate? Or do you just be there and participate? And so Christians here were confronted with this, and I think it was a real confrontation, and I would suggest Satan has part to do with this, as we'll see later, that involves real sexual immorality. I want you to compare that to the letter to Pergamum. Go back up a little bit. In verse 14, in the letter to Pergamum, he tells the Pergamum, Saints, I have a few things against you because, you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. The teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak 
to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols. And to commit acts of immorality. Now there the order is reversed. Uh, that could be just stylistic. I don't, don't know. But the e eating things sacrificed to idols is first. And then he talks about the Nicolaitans in verse 15, which I take as uh, the same group as those who held the teaching of Balaam. Some commentators see them as two different groups. And so you have this group of Nicolaitans. That term's not used in Thyatira. It is mentioned in the letter to Ephesus. It seems to be a problem in Asia Minor. People in the church who are somehow pushing in the direction of these two things. Eating things sacrificed to idols and committing acts of immorality. And all the guilds are everywhere in Asia Minor. They are particularly strong in Thyatira. Now, um, Note Numbers 25, if you'll keep your finger there and go over to Numbers 25. Or tell your Bible on the iPhone that you're coming back in a minute. Uh, numbers 25, beginning in verse 1. And why I'm going here is you know, he talks about Balaam. Okay, Balaam at Pergamum, that's an analogy to the Old Testament. Jezebel in Thyatira, that's an analogy to the Old Testament. So Jesus and the vision given to John is going back to Old Testament imagery to try to help us understand some things. And this is important, verse 1 of chapter 25. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Now, the very fact that it mentions the daughters of Moab makes you think this is probably sexual immorality, although some say that it's spiritual adultery because of the next verse. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So you see their idolatry of, of the Israelites. Okay, and they haven't gone into the promised land yet. Verse 3, so Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So this is serious stuff in terms of the judgment of the Lord upon them. And it matches some of the things we're going to see in the statements of judgment in Thyatira. Now go over to Numbers 31. Now Balaam is not mentioned there, but he is mentioned in chapter 31. We see in verse 12, they brought the captives and the prey, the spoil to Moses. In verse 15, and Moses said to them, have you spared all the women? Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. Here Balaam is credited with it. And who is, it's the women that he used. So that tells me that sexual immorality is, is implied in this context, even though there is spiritual idolatry taking place. We cannot eliminate the sexual immorality. But he says, these, the women, caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, so the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. And so this was quite a serious thing. And so we see in the comparison of Pergamum to Thyatira, this Jezebel faction and this idea of eating things sacrificed to idols and the idea of committing acts of immorality is not something that's brand new in Thyatira. And it's something that in the Old Testament days, the Israelites in the wilderness faced as one of their biggest problems. And what is that big problem? It is letting the culture around you tell you how to live. And I believe God's people in every generation face that battle. And that could be at the top of the list. 
Now we can subdivide it into specific things, but the, we let the culture around us, we let humanity, society, tell us how to think and how to live. That was true of the Israelites in the wilderness, and it seems to be true here. So what is our greatest problem? It is that very thing. Now, let me express it through another Old Testament character that's not alluded to here, and that is Solomon. 1 Kings 11.4 says his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God. He practiced mixed affections. What do you expect with a guy that has hundreds of wives and concubines? You know, you, I'm amazed that the, you know, one of the smartest men in the world, wisest man in the world, would do that. He obviously left some of his wisdom behind. Why? He let them turn his head away from God in his heart. You know, he still feigned following of Yahweh. But his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God. He was giving him just peace. He had mixed affections. Now we have uh, the famous book, Richard Niebuhr's book, Christ and Culture, which D.A. Carson wrote an update, uh, thinks we need to maybe change, but he had some categories. The Christ against culture which D.A. Carson accused me of holding to in one of my presentations, the Christ of culture, which is uh, accommodation, much liberal Christianity is that. In fact, in fact, did you know, if you take a real liberal, I mean a classical liberal, you take a liberal Baptist, and I'm a Baptist, so that's why I'm pick on the Baptist, a liberal Roman Catholic priest and a little Jewish, uh, liberal Jewish rabbi, they're all the same thing. All they do is they take what's in society or culture bring it into their organization and stamp it with the name of their organization. That's, that's the Christ of accommodation where the church accommodates the culture. And there's Christ above culture which tries to do both and then versions of that Christ in culture and paradox, Christ the transformer of culture. All these different categories that Niebuhr has, he tried to wrestle with the idea. Now, Niebuhr himself was neo-Orthodox, if I understand him right. So he's not in our camp. But what we're seeing here is the Christ of culture. That's where syncretism is the strongest. And by syncretism, the merging, the attempt to do both God's things and somebody else's things. And ultimately, we know who that somebody is. And so, the Christ of culture is the battle we have. And you know, we've already talked about it, you know that's our fight right now. In fact, we feel it more in the last five years than we felt it probably in the last 20. But I felt it 20 years ago. And we always feel it. Uh, but it's like we're on a roller coaster and we made it to the top and now the last five years we're on the downside. Now I'm going to present some of the things that we're up against. I'm going to present this particular slide uh, in postmodern style. Just to tip my hat to the postmodernist. Okay? Homosexuality. Marxism. Transgenderism, environmentalism, critical race theory. There you go, Andy. This slide will help you with everything. <laughs> Globalism, lawlessness. And by that, I don't mean just simply not following the, God's ways, just lawlessness in society. I mean, you ever read the first four verses of Habakkuk? I feel like... I'm, ta I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like it's America he's talking about. And in Pennsylvania, behind the Iron Curtain, um, 
you know, in the election we just had, you know, they made a rule, the governor made a rule. Uh, his staff, the, the bureaucrats, they allowed the ballots to come in all the way to Friday of election, of election week. Remember that? Well, you know, the U.S. Constitution doesn't allow that. They violated the U.S. Constitution because it says only the state legislatures can do that. Well, why didn't they go have those state legislatures do that? Because they're controlled by the Republicans. See, they don't care about the law. That's lawlessness. It is cultural lawlessness. And we're, we're up against it. People who don't care. The Constitution is just a piece of paper. The statutes are just pieces of paper. So who cares? Then there's the criminalization of Christianity that's going on. You know, frankly, they would really like for us to disappear. And then anti-Semitism. Since I'm with the Friends of Israel, I made that one a little big. <laughs> and it's erupting, especially in the progressive left. I'm going to talk about that in my fifth presentation. And so we have all these things are being thrown at us and the speed with which things are moving and changing. And, and it's really startling to us because we've never seen this to this level before. And what is it? It is the Christ of culture when Christians cave, as people in the church I belong to have done, some of them, and they've left because our church did not subscribe to transgenderism. And there'll be more and more of that. It'd be real helpful if you had your doctrinal statement on your website, churches, so people won't come bother you. Maybe they will, maybe they'll come just to sue you. I don't know. But somehow we need to address these questions from within biblical truth, and that means we cannot accommodate. We cannot Practice syncretistic idolatry. And that's what that is. And we shouldn't sugarcoat that. If we cave, if we say it's okay, and we do kind of a I'm okay, you're okay thing, that's sin. And if we allow it into our church, like the church of Thyatira allowed Jezebel and her faction into the church, it's nothing but syncretistic idolatry. And we might expect the same response to us that Jesus had for Thyatira. So maybe we ought to look at that. He gives a call to repent in verse 21. I gave her time to repent. So somehow a message from God to her, or maybe the church people are talking to her and he's using the leaders of the church to talk to her. I gave her time to repent. And she does not want to repent, so she refuses. And repentance here is change her mind. She needs to change her mind about what she's teaching, thinking, what she's practicing, and what she's telling others to do. She needs to change all that and come back to God. But then he pronounces temporal judgment on the Jezebel faction. And this isn't temporal. I don't think it's talking about hellfire down the road. I think it's temporal judgment in their immediate future. And here's where I say we need to be careful. If, if the number one pressure upon us, and it's subtle sometimes. It's not as blatant as transgenderism. But it could be other issues. And, and we decide what we believe and we decide what we do based upon what the pressure from culture pushes us to say and do. But what's the first thing? On Jezebel, there in verse 22. This is rather powerful. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness. Now, the word sickness there is in italics. It's not in the Greek text. I will cast her upon a bed. Contextually, it seems to imply uh, almost a deathbed idea. 
it is implied illness. The context is pretty strong as we go along. So I'm going to bring sickness, maybe a sickness unto death for Jezebel. That's what Jesus says. First thing. Then on her followers, notice he says, and those who commit adultery with her, and I think that means those who practice, not those who have sex with her, but those who practice immorality along with her practice in the guilds, I'm going to cast them into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Quit following her, in other words. Now, the great tribulation here, I don't think is, it's probably in this context, not looking ahead and talking about the tribulation of chapters 6 through 19. I think it's talking about a temporal judgment coming. And uh, the next part kind of clarifies that. Some take the followers of verse 23 as a different group, but I think they're the same group as those who commit adultery with her. And it says, I will kill her children, her spiritual children, those who are following her lead. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And the word pestilence there is the word death. And there are many contexts in the Septuagint where that same Greek word is used to simply imply death by disease. And I think it's drawing upon that language here. And so I'll kill her children. One, one translation, I will kill her children with death. What a way to say that. I will kill her children with death. But the idea is I will kill her children with pestilence, with disease. She's on her deathbed with some kind of illness and I'll do the same thing with her children. She and her children will die after experiencing some tribulation, some hardships. Would you want that? Would I want that? No, I don't think any of us would just you know, sign up and get on that bus right away. I think, though there are subtle things that we're not paying attention to sometimes, we need to continually be evaluating our lives to make sure. The result of this, there is a result. The church will know God's knowledge. He says that first. The churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. God knows the intimate details of us. He reads our minds. He knows our hearts. Absolutely. And the church will know that he knows that. Because he has judged them. He's given his word. Now he's going to judge them. And then it says... And his fairness, because he goes on to say, I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. They'll know God's knowledge and his fairness because they will experience it as he honors his commitments. This is pretty stout stuff. And in American churches right now, about 50% of our churches need to die. Christianity would be stronger, as one guy has said years ago. It's still true today. Christianity in America is 3,000 miles wide and an inch deep. And something must change. But now he moves to the charge to others who are not in the Jezebel faction. You know, they have been tolerating Jezebel and her faction. Some would say even sanctioning it since she's called a, she calls herself a prophetess and they're allowing that to go on in the church. Some commentators even think that her husband is the pastor of the church. I think that's a stretch. They must have been in some churches that we know. But verse 24, but to the rest, I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, that is the remaining ones, who do not hold this teaching. Okay. And then it describes who have not known the deep things of Satan. Who have not known the deep things of Satan. Notice this phrase, as they call them, as they 
probably refers back to the Jezebel faction. So they have not known the deep things of Satan as the Jezebel faction calls them. Now what in the world is that? It's probably the hardest thing to really understand in the letter, but uh, most likely, I mean, the idea that Satan's involved, that's not hard to figure out, but just exactly what do they mean by the deep things of Satan? That phrase occurs in one Pauline passage, uh, I think, or something similar to that. Some commentators have suggested that uh, they're kind of make, glossing over the sin of this. Well, we, we can participate in this. Almost Gnostic. Our bodies don't matter, right? If you're Gnostic, you can get away with anything. Because the body is, is evil, but it's the spirit that matters. And so they justified their participation. I can participate in that, and it won't affect my faith. Have we heard that from people in our generation? I can do that, and it won't bother my spirituality. And then Jesus says, there's no additional burden I'm going to place on you, those who have not followed that teaching. He says I, one thing, verse 25, nevertheless what you have, hold fast until I come. Now I'm either going to die or Jesus is going to come, rapture the church. One of, the first, one of those will happen. But until you come to your ultimate end, don't give up Christian living. And the issue here is not simply believing in Jesus, but it is the Christian life and the full orbit of all that we have. So hold fast until I come. Don't change your doctrine. Kind of follow Chafer Theological Seminary's list. It's a pretty good list. But in the details under that, make sure you practice fully and follow holy with the Lord, and don't cave to the idolatry around you. Because it does matter. Promise to overcomers. And I, this is really not part of the main point of what I'm trying to get across, so I will just summarize this. Ruling over the nations with Christ, and giving the gift of the morning star, which I take as Jesus himself. That is a special new relationship, increased fellowship with the Lord, which, of course, is going to easily happen after the second coming. And then the charge to listen to the Spirit, 229. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is said at the end of each letter. The plural of the churches matters. He's saying all the churches pay attention. And I think it opens up the door to application for every church of every age. And the fact that you have the Old Testament analogies reminds us of the great problem that every person who follows the Lord, all the people of God, in every generation, no matter what dispensation, struggle with cultural pressure, and we are prodded to commit idolatry. Let's stand firm. Let's hold fast. Let's do what Jesus told the Thyatirans to do. And let's don't give up the faith, or anything to do with the Christian life. Are you listening to the Spirit? And if not, why not? Let me say a prayer for us. Lord, I thank you for these people, and I especially thank you for the pastors who are here. I ask you, Lord, in our day to give them two things. I ask you to give them courage to stand against the evil one, with courage to stand up to the crowd, with courage to follow your word when it's not popular. And I also pray, Lord, that you'd give them great wisdom. All these thorny problems and knotty problems, and how is the best way to address it in the practical everyday workings out of your ways? We need wisdom for that. And I pray, Lord, if some of them here stand one day before even magistrates and others to, be, to give an account for their preaching and teaching of the truth, I pray that in that day you would cause them to stand firm 
and hold fast to what you have said. And I pray you'd help all of us not to wander off the path when there are so many temptations. Help us not to cave in our day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, any questions and answers? Uh, you can give both. Uh, Mike, real quick, First uh, Corinthians chapter 8, Paul indicates that eating meat sacrificed to idols is not a problem, so also it doesn't cause the weaker believers to stumble. And then maybe having Pergamum and Thyatira where it is a problem, is the difference because they were actually worshiping the idols, not just eating the meat? Yes, I think one is probably the meat you buy down in the marketplace after they bring it down, because obviously the idol doesn't really eat the meat. Have you noticed that? Okay, so what do they do with it? They just want to sit there and rot? No, they take it down to the marketplace and sell it. I think that's probably the difference. But also, it's clearly, in, they're, they're in a worship mode. Sometimes those meet, the guild meetings were held at the temple, but not always. But they're in a worship setting. There's some kind of indication in, some kind of indication in 1 Corinthians 8 that maybe some of the people are actually going to the temple to eat the meat or buying it from the market after it had been taken from the temple. Yeah. Any problem with that? or? Well, it, it, to me, it's a potential problem if you go up to the temple. If you just go up to the temple to get it and you're not there actually worshiping, that's, and that would be an issue. Good presentation. Um, I've had many teachers tell me that, uh, you know, the whole seven churches of Revelation is chronological through church history, and Thyatira means continual sacrifice. So a lot of them believe that Thyatira is like the Roman Catholic Church. Does that play into today's situation with yeah. what their, well, it, their influence on this world? I don't hold that view, so in my, it oh. doesn't play for me. <laughs> So if you hold that view, you've got to figure that out somehow. I, I don't hold the historical prophetic nature of the letters. This, this seminary doesn't either, right? Well, you'll have to ask the other teachers. Okay. I mean, they're good people on all sides of that question. It, my view is not that. Other questions? Who? Yeah, some hold the historical prophetic view, some don't. I don't because to me it's allegorical. These are probably the reasons you don't hold to it. Yeah. Um, the Church of the Middle Ages, you just went over the verse that their deeds were greater. That, that to me, is hard to describe the Middle Ages. And um, the Reformation Church is supposed to be the Dark Ages. Um, but, or the Reformation is the asleep church. But the Reformation is actually when the church woke up. So it just doesn't, doesn't really fit. It doesn't fit, yeah. You know, the other thing is that, in my view, um, it damages the eminency of the rapture because if you have to see seven ages of time happen before the rapture, you know, the rapture can't happen at any minute. Yeah. And it has a tendency to be anthropocentric, meaning that Laodicea is us. And in the United States, that's probably true. We are Laodicean, but if you go to the underground church in China... And Iran, it's it's not Laodicean. But others that hold to the view could could speak up, I guess. I'm just it explaining would, it my would, view. Uh, it would also be a view not available to the original audience, yeah. which is a little bother to me. This is a leftover question from years ago. <laughs> what uh, what do you do about? We never talked about. What do you do about the conditionality? It seems there's a conditionality factor with the warnings. Um, and the and the encouragement in every, in every church? No, in the in the seven. 
except for one, I guess, except for Philadelphia. But where there's a warning, it seems like there's a conditionality of, like, and then you overcome. How do you handle that? Do you do, you do it case by case, or do you think it's a general theme? Uh, it seems like one of the harder parts of exegesis of these. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a, as we would say in Alabama, it's a sticky wicket. Uh, but I, I hold that the overcomers are all believers. I do not hold that it's a, a super, uh, uh, superman, super uh, saint group that's better than other Christians. Uh, but that doesn't mean there are no problems for that view. Um, I think every view has, has problems. Conditionality, I'll talk a little bit perhaps to, uh, tomorrow when I deal with, uh, uh, I'm going to get into the letter to Philadelphia when we talk about rapture questions. And uh, so we, we may get into that there. I, you can ask me that maybe there because the language is the clearest there, conditionality language in verse 1. Um, uh, but uh, Jesus, I think he uh, seems to, you know, there's that question. That, that kind of passage in Thyatira makes me wonder if the Jezebel faction is, is really, are they really believers? It's a possibility they're not, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a little harder judge than God sometimes. So he knows those that are his. Yeah, Dr. Hannah, our church history professor at Dallas, used to say, if you learn enough church history, you can make it work. We have the time if you've got questions. Uh, what is your understanding of the angeloi? Uh, each of the seven churches has an angelos. Uh, do you view that as the pastor of that church or the leading elder of that church? And then the rebukes that are given, the praise that's given in the singular, does that apply to the one individual? Uh, I heard you say several times, that it applied to the, the church. church overall. Yeah, I, I see them as human messengers. They could be the pastors or elders from the churches, but whoever it was that was sent to John on Patmos, and he sent them back with, with the stuff uh, to be read, those are the messengers. They're human, in my opinion, although I have respect for the angelic view and other, other views that they have. Uh, I used to hold the angelic view, but I no longer hold that. I think it's human messengers, and the singular... I think is using them as representative for the whole church. That's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Testing? Uh, just had a question. Uh, do you see a, maybe a thread of correlation between the, the trade guilds that were there in Thyatira all the way down to, uh, to what we've experienced in the past few hundred years with Freemasonry? Well, I don't know that Freemasonry is, is, is in the same category as a trade guild. You know, the function of it is different. Uh, perhaps there is, you know, a lot of business talk and in uh, building up business, it would, I guess it'd be similar in that sense, um, but they're not. But they're not centered around a particular trade. You know, guys would become bringing their businesses, and each one would have maybe a different trade. So it's a little bit different in that respect. But I guess you could say there might be some similarities in the spirit of the thing. But I'm not sure beyond that. I wouldn't try to make any historical tie. Do you have any uh, source material on the guild references and that, just the, for the context of that? Yeah, you could look up the commentaries. You could look, uh, look up uh, Bob Thomas, Robert Thomas's two-volume set, probably the best commentary ever written from a dispensational point of view. I wouldn't agree with everything he says, but I think it's the best that's out there. Uh, Buist Fanning has just released a commentary, Dallas Seminary professor. That's not too bad. Um, uh, there's some others. Osborne from Trinity has a commentary. David One, A-U-N-E, has a commentary. Great detail. He gives a, a lot of detail. His conclusions are sometimes squirrely, but he gives a lot of background material. That's the strength of that particular commentary. So he might be helpful in that. And then there are two books, Ramsey's old book on the seven letters, and then Hemmer, H-E-M-E-R, his book on the seven letters. Both of those give excellent background help. So I've given you like five books or so. I forget 
So I don't know if that's any help to you, if you need me uh, during the break or something to give, help me. <laughs> well, I'll give, you some, I'll give you some advice from John Calvin. Good luck. Okay. So you mentioned there's a possible chiastic structure to the seven churches. Uh, could you explain that? I've not heard that before. Yeah. Well, I tell you, uh, the one commentary that actually discusses that is Greg Beal, of all places. He's a mill idealistic. He's kind of all over the place. Um, and I don't agree with him much uh, at all. But uh, I think uh, he points out some of the details there and the uh, the focus on the transition at Thyatira in a few, th- a few ways. And uh, Ephesus and Laodicea, you can see some similarities in and even in, in antimonies between those two. And then you have Sardis and Philadelphia, uh, some similar things where nothing negative is said about them, etc. And then you have the, the middle three all seem to have some similar problems. And, uh, but Thyatira is the longest of the letters by far. Uh, and it has the strongest condemnation language. Unless you want to take, I'll spew you out of my mouth. It's, that's pretty strong, but... Uh, but, but I will I will kill your children with death. You know that's I mean it's got the strongest condemnation of any of the churches, and so uh, it's those kind of collection of reasons that maybe points in that direction. So, and I'm not dogmatic about that, but I I think that's something that's very worth considering. And I'm I'm not one who just hunts for chiasms just for the fun of it. Great. Well, let's go ahead and uh, we'll take a break now. We're running a little ahead, so we'll take a break now until 3, and then we'll get back and start up about 10 minutes early for the last session, and that'll put us from 3 to about, um, we'll wrap up, what? Yeah, till about 6 o'clock. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's take a break. <laughs> 